You are not alone. Presented by www.anantaom.com A free 7-day global online summit on mental health and holistic well-being with Sasha Braganza, Tripura Kashyap, Elena Davidson, John J. Prendergast, Brian Sacheta, and Keith Russell. This global mental health summit is to raise awareness about mental health, help you understand your unique needs, empower you with easy-to-apply tools, release a stigma attached to mental disorder, create a more safe, kind, compassionate, and inclusive world. Hi. I'm Ananta O. I am Powerball loving empaths like you to overcome self-doubt and be the change you wish to see in the world with unapologetic kindness. I hold a mirror for you to gently understand yourself better, recognize your strengths and own a divine unique essence that only you can anchor on this planet. I'm currently training light workers across eight countries to find their purpose and live their mission in oneness of love and breath. We are a growing soul family and I'm grateful to have you here with us right here, right now. A very warm greeting to all of you. We're so grateful to Keith Russell for being here with us today. I'm going to introduce you to Keith right now. So the Endless Spiral was founded and created by Keith Russell. Keith has suffered from depression and body dysmorphia for over 20 years. He was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder in 2018 and has been on a mission ever since to help others share their experiences of mental health. Sport and exercise has had a positive and negative effect on Keith's life. He was inspired to set up the Endless Spiral when he realized so many other people use sport and exercise as an escapism from their mental health battles. So let's talk to Keith about the endless spiral and his life journey. Welcome to the summit, Keith, and thank you so much for being here with us today. You're very welcome, and thanks very much for having me on. My pleasure. So where are you joining us from today? I am in Dublin, in Ireland, in where it's always raining, and it's raining again today. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Keith, thank you again for being here. Can you share, uh, you've shared that, about 20 years you've been experiencing um, you know depression and body dysmorphia would you would you like to share a little bit about that before we move into your podcast and how that was inspired yeah so I mean for over 20 years now I've as, as you mentioned in my in the uh, intro there I've suffered from uh, anxiety and depression and body dysmorphia for a long time and um, I kind of started suffering from body dysmorphia in my early teens uh, when I was enrolled in uh, life-saving classes, which, you know, they're not necessarily swimming lessons. Uh, the life-saving classes would, would kind of involve um, you having to kind of jump in and out of the pool and stand on the side of the pool and kind of rehearse kind of life-saving scenarios and stuff like that. And I just became very very self-conscious and very aware of my body and everyone else's body around me and um if you're not kind of too familiar with body dysmorphia it's it's not necessarily about your weight it's more about your appearance and how you kind of perceive yourself and how you think other people around you perceive you so as I said it's not necessarily about your body weight it could be about your shape so it could be maybe the shape of your nose or um you know the shape of your your ears or whatever so I started being very aware that I was very uncomfortable with how I looked in my early teens and up until that time I never had any experience of feeling anxious or depressed or anything really but I went for those life-saving classes for most of my teens and the body dysmorphia just got worse and my anxiety just got worse and of course, from the anxiety and the body dysmorphia, it kind of stemmed the depression. And it just never really went away. And I mean, I'm, I'm 40 now and it has just has never left me really. I mean, I've, I've managed to deal with most of it in some aspects, but it never really leaves. I mean, I still suffer from, as you mentioned earlier on, um, general anxiety disorder. I still have that. I still have bouts of depression, not as much as anymore, but I still have anxiety. I still have body dysmorphia now, as, as I mentioned, it's not as bad as it used to be, 
I think as you get older, you kind of just start to accept yourself a little bit more. Yeah, but when I was younger, I would sit at home and I would list all the stuff that I didn't like about myself. And it'd be lots. I mean, it would be, I didn't like the shape of my hairline. I didn't like the shape of my chin. I didn't like uh, my wrists. I thought my wrists were too skinny. I thought I thought I had weight on my, my stomach. I thought I had uh, a long, I thought my my neck was too long and skinny. You know, I thought my calves were too small. It was literally just pretty much everything about me. I just didn't like, and that just stemmed from, you know, just being around other people and you're just comparing yourself to other people. And like I said, it just got worse and worse. And it, we didn't mention in the, uh, in the intro there, but I did try and take my own life twice in my twenties. I was that depressed about myself and that anxious about even going on holidays, you know, like on a vacation, I didn't want to take my t-shirt off or, you know, you just wouldn't want to be really in public all that all that much. You know, so that took me up to my 20s. And like I said, I'm now 40 and I'm hopefully sharing my story, trying to inspire other people to to share their stories and speak out and, you know, and realize it's, you know, there is ways to, to deal with these things. It's mostly in your own head. And once you deal with those type of things, you know, there is there is light at the end of the tunnel. As I hopefully I'm I'm showing now. Absolutely. So, um, can you share what was the first time that you uh, chose to get help with this? Because for the longest time, you know, I think it's difficult for people to recognize that they are experiencing a certain problem and that it's possible to get help. So, what was that first time that you seeked help? And what was, you know, what inspired you, supported you in taking that decision to get help? Yeah, um, well, the, the thing is, is when I did get help, it was for the, it was for the depression. And I didn't really, I, at the time, I didn't connect the depression to the body dysmorphia. I didn't even know I suffered from body dysmorphia only recently. Um, I think there's a certain maybe stigma with men and their mental health and uh, there is lots of studies out there that will show that men and body dysmorphia, it goes undiagnosed for a long time, um, unfortunately. So when I sought help, which was in my late 20s, was for the depression. And I didn't, I don't, when I went for the therapy sessions, or I went for it with a counsellor, um, we didn't really talk about my body and my my body shape I don't think it was a long time ago and I don't think we did and um, I think it was more probably I was depressed with I know maybe we had some family issues and maybe stuff like that I remember I you know I broke up with my girlfriend at the time and it was more stuff like that um but it was my my I think it was my friend suggested I go for therapy because nobody knew I suffered from anxiety nobody knew I suffered from depression I didn't talk about it. I didn't tell anybody. And I think it really escalated, obviously, when I tried to take my own life. And it was more the second time I tried to do it was when I was able to share that with one of my friends. Well, I didn't really share the details, but it was good to be able to talk to someone at the time. And he never told anybody. But it was my my parents who suggested I go for therapy for the depression. Well, like I said, that was in my 20s and I went for probably about a year and it really did help the depression. I mean, I really did, you know, it solved, not, it didn't solve, but it, it, it helped my depression. But the other underlying issues just were never dealt with. I just, they were never dealt with. So I only really learned about body dysmorphia and what I was doing was when someone contacted me probably about six months ago to, um, they had seen my blog and they'd seen my, or they listened to my podcast and stuff like that. And they kind of, I think they nearly discovered it before I did. And they were like, mate, would you like to contribute to a media piece over here in Ireland in the news about kind of um, body dysmorphia and eating disorders and how they're closely linked? And I was kind of like, why are they asking me? And then they obviously had picked up on stuff in my blog that I didn't even pick up on. So when I kind of started doing research for, for all that, I started to piece it all together myself, really. 
and it's I'm pretty much learning as I go at the moment with the body dysmorphia but it really is helping me speak to other people like doing this with yourself today and having other people on my podcast now and people have, are sending me their stories and I post on my website and you're able to learn from them and hopefully they're able to learn from my mistakes like don't let these things <laughs> go undiagnosed for so long and um, yeah so that's pretty much where I started getting help thank you thank you for sharing that i'm sorry about the sound in the background uh there's some construction that just started uh, I'm, uh, i apologize okay. for that um would you be able to share keith a little more about men and mental health because you know um generalized conversations about mental health itself are stigmatized and there's such high pressure on men to be a certain way and uh you know there is a huge amount of pressure and expectation to be you know strong and not to um, men find yeah. it difficult often to even emote or express exactly what they're feeling so can you tell us a little more about that for you personally and also since you have been speaking to so many people what have some of your observations been about mental health for men yeah i mean for for me I, I don't know if I really thought about it too much when I was younger as in, in you know, the stigma in men and mental health. I think I just, I, I, subconsciously, I probably, yes, that was probably a reason why I didn't speak out. I was pro it was probably that. Um, yeah, but like, as I got older, I mean, I changed careers in 2008. I used, I was in construction. I used to work for my father and I moved out of that. And when I had to change careers and I had to kind of go back I went, I went back to college and I went back to, you know, re, re kind of educate myself and, and I, you know, so that caused me a lot of anxiety at the time. And that really, you know, changing careers was a big thing for me and kind of, you're, you're kind of introducing yourself back out into the, the workforce and, and like, and, and I completely changed careers. It wasn't like I did something similar i went from construction to digital marketing and graphic design and stuff so they're not even remotely similar so that caused me a huge amount of anxiety and, and that kind of forced me to address my you know anxiety and i went for cbt you know uh, therapy and stuff like that which is which is great for dealing with stuff you know in the here and now but going back to your question about you know men and mental health i didn't even want to mention anything on social media, you know, you could be having a bad day because I didn't want a, a, a potential employer maybe to look at my social media and say, oh, he suffers from depression or he's having a bad day. We don't, I don't want, you know, this is how much it just gets into your head. So again, you're, you're bottling things up and you're, you're kind of pushing things to one side because like you don't want, like I said, an employer or someone else to think you're weak. You know, especially in men, as you, as you mentioned, and quite rightly, you know, men, they want to be dominant and they have to feel they have to be the breadwinner and they have to be strong and all these type of things. And I really do think that is probably the main issue with it is just the stigma with men and mental health and they don't want to speak out. Um, so, yeah, so that was the one main part for me anyway, personally, was changing careers and not wanting to speak out sooner because of I did like you know I had a family to support and I didn't want to risk not getting a potential job or something like that so, so you know so that was my story anyway but going to the other you know since I started doing this you know so, so many people I guess so many well, not so many I get quite a lot of messages through my social medias and especially through the website people and usually always men saying oh we heard you on the radio the other day or we've read your recent blog or whatever like I have um an article coming out next week in an, in a, a paper over here in Ireland it's a national paper and that's going to be quite a big um it, it's, it's an exclusive interview I did and hopefully that's going to really bring a lot of awareness but was, like you know so it's stuff like that that I'm trying to do you know to get the message out there but I guess so many messages from guys just saying, you know, I've suffered from the body dysmorphia is usually what the messages I get. I've suffered for, for so long and thanks for, for speaking out that I've, you know, 
it's great that you know a, a man is out there speaking out about this so they're usually the main um kind of messages i get is just thanking me for for speaking out and hopefully inspiring someone else to reach out and share as well and like i said i always offer if someone has a story that, that they want to tell i'll you know they can email it to me and i can put it up on my website on the blog section and i share that on my social medias as well and i share that on mine and i share it on the end of spiral as well and just to kind of give people a little bit of exposure on their story and even if i always say to people as well like you don't even have to put your name on it i can post it as anonymous which i've done in the past and then once kind of people see the nice messages that come through they usually kind of like to put their name on it then and say you know okay it was me who wrote it which is brilliant it's great you know and it's really is it's very therapeutic for me as well to be able to read these stories and and see that there are so many other people who have similar symptoms and similar you know traits and stories as me and, and again vice versa for them and i think that really helps as well the fact that you you're not alone and your story isn't you might feel unique and personal to you but a lot of the traits are not unique you know so that's been really beneficial for me so i hope i hope, I hope i've answered your question yes absolutely and this has been so touching and heartwarming thank you so much for sharing and also for setting up a platform for more people to come and share their stories um we recognize we're not alone and that there are so many like us who have these experiences in their own way so uh what has your experience been like with your podcast um yeah well i mean someone who suffers from anxiety quite a lot it was tough to set up a podcast um you know you're putting yourself out there um, and it was something i kind of had i'd always wanted to do a podcast and then when i started doing the mental health stuff it was kind of just a natural progression really because I kind of was thinking that well maybe a lot of the people who are sending me blogs you know writing can be tough for people and not everyone is able to write their stories down but maybe some people would like to talk about it instead so it was just another form or it was just another platform i was offering people to share their stories as well you know they didn't have to write a blog if they wanted to come on for just for a chat and i always said if one person listens to the podcast and they get something from it then i'm happy with that you know i mean thankfully quite a lot of people are listening to the podcast but even if it wasn't like that and one person listened to it like i said i'd be quite happy and um, for just people just to come on and share their stories and and it, it, the thing with the podcast is that for a good few episodes i never really talked about myself i kind of let the guests share their stories and i don't know whether that was intentional by me maybe it was but I've been a lot more open on the podcast about my story now as well. Um, I think it was probably the fact that because my because I did a couple of pieces in the media and they got picked up, I, maybe I just felt a little bit more comfortable talking about me because I didn't want to do a podcast and just talk about me. <laughs> kind of like not only but nobody wants to listen to me all the time, so I just thought it'd be good to do you know a podcast with different topics. So I haven't just had people on who shared their story i've kind of had quite a lot of different guests where i've had a sports psychologist on um divya jen from uh, india as well she's so she was brilliant so she deals with kind of sports athletes kind of elite athletes as well and um, i've had a nutritionist counselor on who kind of deals with not just nutrition but kind of helps people have a, a good understanding and a healthy relationship with food as well and um, especially for eating disorders is quite important and the body dysmorphia, you know, that's quite important as well. So I've, I've had guests like that on. I've had athletes, former athletes, kind of present athletes who suffer from depression and they suffer from anxiety. So it's been brilliant, especially even for me to be able to just sit there and listen to advice as well from people. So not only their stories, qualified, you know, people who give, you know, important topics of information because... I have always tried to steer away from giving advice on my podcast and on my social media because I'm kind of like, there's lots of people out there who are qualified to give the advice and I would rather maybe just stick to sharing my story and inspiring people to share theirs rather than telling them, well, you maybe you should do this or do that because nobody's perfect and I'm still struggling with my stuff as well. So I don't want to be hypocritical where I'm 
struggling myself but going on my podcast and saying well you should do this I just I, I, I didn't want to do that I wanted the podcast to be honest and real as well you know, to say listen okay I'm hosting the mental health podcast but I'm not perfect either you know so I have to say the podcast has been brilliant I'm really really proud of the podcast to be honest it's really really picked up a lot and it was nominated for a people's choice award and um, beginning of this year it was nominated for and again, I didn't do a podcast for that. I don't do it for people, you know. Congratulations on oh, that. Thanks very, yeah. thanks very Congratulations. much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, yeah, so that's been the podcast. So I'm, I'm quite chuffed and I'm quite proud of the podcast as well. Because I know with people with anxiety, well, especially me anyway, it can be very hard on yourself and you can be very critical of yourself. And so I the other day I posted um, some artwork for my, po uh, my podcast and I put the little banner for the award nominated on it and I said look I'm just going to put up there it's a little bit of vanity but I'm, I just said to myself I'm going to give myself a break for today and I think that's good you know to give yourself a reward every now and again so I, I gave myself a little bit of praise and I put up on social media and I says well there you go if you don't you know if you don't like it well that's fine but I'm quite proud of what I'm doing so absolutely that's so wonderful that you you know it's really amazing and it, also, uh, you know, the, there's an adage that says when you hold space for your authenticity, it opens up space for others to own themselves, yeah. right? Yeah, so I exactly. think through your stories, you're absolutely showing the way and holding that space and encouraging others to bring out their uh, life stories. And that's very powerful. And one person at a time, like you mentioned, uh, yeah. you know, the world changes and you're a change maker. I hope so. Well, I mean... Uh, yeah I didn't really yeah exactly I mean I did the thing is I didn't really start it for that I kind of started you know the, the the pandemic and COVID you know hit here and as well as it hit everywhere and we were in lockdown and I'm like I'm still working from home now and I had time on my hands and I think I think when a lot of people have time on their hands especially me and this is where the name came from the endless spiral I find myself in an endless spiral of some of negative thoughts and stuff and I was just sitting sitting there spending a lot of time not you know and this is the whole you know the holistic approach where the social aspect comes into wellness as well and I wasn't getting the social you know interaction with people and I was sitting at home and I just said you know what I'm going to put my story down and I wrote a blog of my own and I, I didn't go into too much detail in it but I just I wrote it for myself and it was just a blog page and I put up and there, I just got a great response to it and then I, I wrote another one and I said and then I had people contact me saying well can we share our stories and I said well yeah I put the, I put them up on my website and because I can do that type of stuff it just went from there um so yeah I was just I was spending an awful lot of time in my own head at home and I just wanted to finally just say you know what I'm, not, I'm just going to do this I'm not going to think about it anymore because as I'm sure people know who are, are watching this and listening to this when you have anxiety you can be a procrastinator quite a lot and you can put a lot of stuff off and I just said, you know what, let's just do this. Let's just do it. And Amazing. I did it. Amazing. <laughs> and what a courageous, inspiring step that is. Wonderful. So, um, Keith, would you like to share a little bit about um, some of the practices that you uh, integrate into your life that have helped you with uh, your anxiety, depression and body dysmorphia? Yeah, I mean, well, for a long time, I didn't practice enough and that is the biggest issue as we mentioned earlier on about men as well I put it off it wasn't diagnosed but now well for the body dysmorphia I used to work out and I used to, I used to exercise the nutritionist counselor I had on my podcast that she doesn't like to use the word exercise she likes to use the word movement because she said exercise can be a little bit daunting for people and she said you can do housework you can do chores and it's movement and it's still exercise so I have to start changing my language and start saying movement. But anyway, when I used to exercise, I used to do it for to improve the way I look. And it wasn't it wasn't beneficial to me. So now I, I'm exercising and incorporating movement into my daily habits. And I'm now exercising for the neck up rather than from the neck down. So I'm I'm now trying to exercise to to benefit from the way it makes me feel rather than how it makes me look and that's been a huge turning point for me is to not get stressed and not get 
worried about am I working out enough um, you know all these type of things I'm now just exercising for my mental health and that's been massive for me I do mindfulness I try mindfulness I'm not the best at it <laughs> um, I must be honest I do kind of my mind does wander a little bit but I did have a conversation on the podcast with somebody and then what they said to me was mindfulness doesn't have to be say a meditation or sitting in the one spot for him a mindfulness was where he was able to do something and I was able to take his mind away from the negative or the negative thoughts and I thought that was brilliant so now I can bring my kids like to the beach and I can be mindful do you know what I mean it, it can be so many things and um, so I'm starting to do that a lot more now because obviously with the anxiety I didn't really go out a lot and I didn't really spend enough time with my kids as I probably should have so now I'm trying to incorporate maybe just getting out and be a little bit more mindful as well and um, and the, the, the last thing I have introduced and this is only recent is the yoga Everybody tell, has told me yoga, you know, is you should try yoga. And I never did it I, because I was so wrapped up in working out to kind of make me make my look myself look different. I would be, I felt I had to lift weights and I had to go to the gym. And I always thought yoga wasn't for me. But now the fact that I'm starting exercising for my mental health, I've incorporated yoga. And I'm getting a bit older as well. And I'm getting a bit stiff and my back is, does be a bit stiff. So I've, yoga has been brilliant for you know, just, and I do it at home, I go upstairs, I close the door, I put my couple of mats on the ground, you know, I've tried yoga, listen to music, I take mute the earphones out, I'll just do it myself, because I'm only learning, so I, sometimes I have a video to watch as well, and I find that brilliant, you know, just getting a bit of headspace for even 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it's amazing, you know, and like I said, speaking to you today, and doing podcasts, and speaking to other people, I get tips, from people all the time about stuff so i'm always incorporating something different in now and like and look it takes time it's a it's a learning curve and not everything works for everybody either so Absolutely. yeah something do you know what i mean so it might work Absolutely. for some people it might not work for for you so you know i'm trying to i'm, I'm trying to incorporate more stuff all the time <laughs> Oh, wow. I love that. And, uh, you know, when you shared about mindfulness as a way of life and integrated into daily life and mm. your relationships and the way you have spent time with family, and we've actually written a book called Begin to Be You. And uh, it speaks about, you know, identifying where you are at and what is it that you could do, an individual could do, and where could they start with, uh, you know, getting to know themselves and connecting, going deeper within their own journeys. Yeah. And um, yeah, so we've, we've given a few tips inside this book on, uh, you know, where a person could start and how it could be. Um, a daily process. We have about seven weeks worth of uh, exercises in there and we have the um, inner wisdom activity sheets where we help people reflect and go deeper into themselves. And uh, yeah, it's, it's lovely that we all Amazing. take that journey into ourselves. Yeah. Um, Keith, that's been, it's been really wonderful speaking with you today. And thank you so much for taking the time for being with us. And um, are there any last insights you might like to share at this point? Um, that's a question I always ask people at the end of my po podcast <laughs> as well. And I'm always good at asking the question, but I'm never good at answering the question. <laughs> but I, for me personally, it's to just to, to speak to people and to reach out and don't live in your own head. Yeah. Even writing your thoughts down on a piece of paper, even if you want to throw the piece of paper in the bin, I find just getting your thoughts out of your head and putting them even on a piece of paper can be so, so therapeutic because I think you can live in your own head for so, so often. And usually for me, anyway, there'd be negative thoughts. Right. So just, you know, speak to people, you know, pick up the phone, reach out to people, you know, like I said, write your thoughts down. Just don't be silent. And that's the one thing I've found because I was silent for, for so long. And it was not helpful for me at all. And I, like I said, I know I don't like giving advice to people, but that's one thing I would say is I have personal experience of that. Please don't suffer in silence. It's not good for anybody, you know. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, Keith, there's another question that's coming up right now. And if you can, you know, share your response to it. Um, for you personally, how has getting professional help uh, helped you? Because oftentimes we yeah. speak about getting help from friends and, you know, writing and journaling, but sometimes, you know, that does not uh, prove to be enough it doesn't suffice and yep. then you, we need yep. to go get professional help and especially for those uh, for the people in the audience who may be at that edge right now who have tried journaling who have tried things on their own but maybe uh, questioning whether it's time to get professional help uh, what would you say at this point yeah exactly well I mean just as you say that I've actually got an appointment with my therapist tomorrow um so I mean I, like I said, I have kind of my, my own personal family were not all that close and we had so many issues that we didn't deal with. And yeah, exactly. Journaling, like I, I wrote blogs because it's, and you can write blogs. And like I said, it is good for getting it, you know, your part of your head, but it is your, your perspective as well. So, I mean, a qualified, you know, therapist or whoever to speak to was able to, to break those thoughts down and help you understand them. Cause that was the big thing for me is when I, you know, I, I tried the CBT and again, it was fine because it was, yeah, you know, it deals with stuff in the present, but I had a lot of issues in the past that I hadn't dealt with. So when I went to another therapist who would deal with that, it was f fabulous because she was able to kind of, um, kind of, um, break down my thoughts and break down and it helps me understand other people's perspective of stuff as well. So you might hold grudges and stuff like that against other people, but when you listen to, you know from a qualified therapist or wherever it is and they can explain these things to you it was so enlightening enlightening for me you know to understand that you know what i mean because it just allows you to you know to be able to appreciate other people's point of views as well and to help you understand that maybe the stuff you wrote in your blog or your your journal might not necessarily be incorrect it might be your perspective but it doesn't mean you're always right so that's been one massive thing for me when I sought professional help was to basically they helped me understand my thoughts and I and even just speaking to them and telling them stuff that you can't tell you just maybe you don't want to speak to your family member because there might be stuff you, you know you're just, you're just not ready to share and a professional you know therapist is perfect I mean like I said I probably wouldn't have been where I am today without speaking to him, you know, um, massive help, massive, they really, really are. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing all that you have shared with us today, Keith. This means a lot. And um, I will be sharing your website and your social media links so that people can get in touch with you. And this has been such a blessing for all of us. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Very welcome. Thanks very much for having me on. I really actually enjoyed this today. It was really good. Thank nice you. little therapy session for the two of us. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we will stay in touch. And for all those of you who will be watching this, you can get in touch with Keith and look up his website and follow his podcast to continue to stay connected and inspired by him. Thank you so much for today.